Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar with uh, Dr. Elisha Waldman. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to go over a couple items as far as your engagement. Um, everyone is muted. Um, there's an interface, there should be a control panel interface box on the right hand side of your screen. Um, we will be taking Q&A and questions. We encourage that. There's a question box. There are a question tab on that control panel. You just type your questions. Paul and I will be accumulating those and we'll have a Q&A session at the end. If you have any technical issues I might be able to help with, there is a chat box also, chat tab. You can just type your message in there and uh, I'll do my best to, to assist you. I'm now gonna turn the proceedings over to Michael Doan. Well, good afternoon, everyone. We welcome you to this, uh, our second education and research forum co-hosted by Spiritual Health Services and the CPE Centers of M Health Review. Um, I am the system director for those programs. We're especially thankful to our co-host, Transforming Chaplaincy, the organization that has played a most vital role in fostering research and research literacy throughout our discipline. Um, and also allow me to introduce a couple of other folks to you. Uh, in a moment, you'll be hearing from Paul Gauchut, uh, the research chaplain for M Health Fairview. Paul is a former Transforming Chaplaincy Research Fellow, uh, completing that work in 2019. And he's also the convener of the Hospice Palliative Spiritual Care Research Network for Transforming Chaplaincy. And then finally, I wanted uh, to introduce to you Dr. Brad Benson, who will bring, bring a welcome to you on behalf of our health system. Dr. Benson serves as a professor of internal medicine and pediatrics for the University of Minnesota Medical Center. And he also is the chief academic officer for M Health Fairview System. So welcome, Dr. Benson. Thank you, Michael. And I just point out it's uh, my, I'm having trouble with the uh, webcam and so you won't be able to see me, but I, I am a firm believer things happen for a reason and it's likely a blessing that you uh, don't have to look at my face this morning. But uh, it is an enthusiastic face right now. I'm really excited about this. I'm, on behalf of the larger M Health Fairview system, uh, I wanna welcome you uh, to this education and research uh, forum hosted by uh, the spiritual health department. When I think of the mantra of my office, uh, it's really, you know, that, that uh, we're a community uh, learning together to improve healthcare and health. Uh, and I, I really mean that. And when I think of uh, the synergy of us coming together uh, and what we can do uh, together, uh, it's been impressive. And, and research has really been at the core. Uh, along with uh, education. Uh, and right now we have over 600 clinical trials uh, across the fields of cancer, diabetes, heart health, women's health, children's health, mental health, uh, infectious diseases. And you know, since the founding of, of this uh, land grant institution, the University of Minnesota, uh, we've really had a core value uh, of discovery. Uh, and you know, when I think of you know the 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 challenges of of COVID nineteen. Uh, there really have been some opportunities uh, that we've realized in our partnership. You know, we uh, as of January uh, one, twenty nineteen, really uh, inked a, a, a deep uh, partnership and commitment to really uh, form uh, M Health uh, Fairview. And I had high aspirations for our our research endeavors. COVID really moved us ahead light years in a short period of time. Uh, and I think it's because, you know, we, we all very clearly see the value of research. You know, like you, uh, you know, I wonder when I'm gonna be able to see my parents again uh, and not worry about uh, bringing harm to them uh, because of COVID. And I think the questions that we together are answering uh, really uh, are, are clear to, to everyone right now. Uh, and you know, when I when I uh, think about uh, the things that we've uh, done together, we put together a COVID dedicated uh, hospital, Bethesda Hospital. We now have uh, a variety of trials going on uh, with a bunch, you know, so remdesivir uh, and uh, an adaptive uh, trial of a bunch of different uh, treatment options 
uh, associated with remdesivir. Losartan, we have two cellular therapies, a natural killer cell uh, trial, a mesenchymal stem cell trial. We are ramping up to be involved uh, in immunoglobulin trials uh, and a vaccine trial. Uh, and all of these are going to seamlessly transition uh, to St. Joe's uh, over the next uh, month. Uh, in addition, you know, it's amazing to have all the bright people around. We partnered with the College of Mechanical Engineering, uh, and the, some of the work of this partnership started when one of our learners, uh, Haitian Fu, saw a patient die alone, uh, and you know that the agony and the the distress associated with with that led her to walk over to the department of engineering and ask hey does anybody know anything about aerosols and she ran into and i find this you know providence uh the the quizzical professor who looked at her and said well i, I happen to be the the editor-in-chief of the journal of aerosol science uh and you know fast forward they are in uh uh, version five of an aerosol booth that helps patients be surrounded by their family at those uh, critical times by pulling out all of the uh, aerosols. Uh, and I could go on and on uh, with these stories. Uh, but, you know, what makes this so exciting is that I think we can drive clinical and patient outcomes on a national and international stage while training the next generation of healthcare practitioners uh, and leaders. And we currently are offering training experiences to 68 different learner types that rotate through the system. So true inter-professional uh, education in addition to you know, physician, nurses, pharmacists, social workers, uh, and our clinical pastoral uh, educators. And I would say you know, the direction and practice of our spiritual health services has been for, informed by research and education. Uh, M Health Fairview Center for Clinical Pastoral Education has been accredited for the past 58 years, includes two residency programs, five intern programs that are supported by a faculty of six ACPE educators uh, and staff uh, chaplains, uh, which are uh, supported and, and they serve as valued members of an uh, interdisciplinary uh, team. Uh, and I think you know, day after day I see them, they bring a level of attentiveness, compassion, support, advocacy, uh, to patients, families, uh, and staff. And that team is led by uh, Chaplain Paul uh, Galchet, uh, our research chaplain. Uh, and the, uh, the department has collaborated on uh, a host of interventions exploring the impact of COVID visitor restrictions on patients, family, and staff. Uh, and, you know, my personal thanks to Paul. He was one of, we called him the three wise men. Uh, who reviewed all of our clinical research going on and approved it uh, through the lens of uh, ethics and safety uh, for our discovery partners uh, or our, uh, the individuals we sometimes call patients. So uh, I think we're really pleased to be partnering with our chaplains uh, in the CPE program uh, in pursuit of best practices for the sake of patients, families, and staff. And, uh, you know, I will stop here uh, and just uh, would share gratitude uh, for this long-term collaboration and excitement about what's to come. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Benson. And uh, I so appreciate your support for this um, event as well as initiatives in the past and as we move forward. A big thanks to Michael Doan as well for uh, supporting this event to even happen in, in future to come because they wouldn't have occurred without that uh, backing. We're excited to let you know that if you have a nursing background that this presentation has gone through the process to enable contact hours to occur. And I'll mention this at the end of our presentation as well, that you are um, welcome to complete a survey and at the end of that rainbow will be a place for you to put in your email to get a certificate. Additionally, we want to let you know that physicians are also eligible to receive some contact hours for this as well. So um, please let your colleagues know. We want them to be able to take advantage of the wisdom that will be available to us uh, with Dr. Waldman's sharing. And by way of gratitude, I also want to um, extensive thanks some of these names and voices you've already heard but to also say thanks to um, Lisa, Marcus, Leah and Dr. Finch for their uh, roles and the emails that we've exchanged many times over so uh, appreciate their guidance and their support for this as well and I guess certainly for the moment that you've all been waiting for uh, so glad that you are able to join us Dr. Waldman uh, just a few words I was able to 
do some significant editing from your CV to put in a few words here about your uh, background. So you certainly are a scholar. Um, you're an academic and mm -hmm. want to acknowledge um, your importance of uh, what you do and your contributions as an associate professor of medicine at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University. Your role as a clinician, that you are in the trenches and that drives who you are and um, what you're about as the division head for palliative care at Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. You are a researcher and author. You're published in a number of medical journals, national media outlets, and an author of many books. And many people have been able to experience your uh, work as a healer, as a friend, and I would add, mention some of those places uh, are places like Yale, Columbia University, and the Hadassah Medical Center in Jerusalem. And um, I've had the pleasure of spending some time with you, and I'm so grateful that you are generously given of your time right now as well to others here. So, Dr. Alicia Walden, thank you for being with us, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh, thank you very much. I, let's uh, do the technical check for those. Uh listening in, we sort of had some technical glitches and this was close to the wire. So uh, Paul or anyone else, can you confirm that you can hear me just fine? Okay, all right, that is helpful. Um, well, uh, welcome to my office. Uh, I am uh, grateful to everybody. Uh, I'm grateful uh, to both, especially Paul and Brad for uh, orchestrating this. Uh, Paul and I, as he mentioned, worked together uh, a couple summers ago, which might be something we'll touch on in the course of this talk, um, at a, a, a course at the George Washington Institute for Spirituality and Healthcare. Um, and it's it's just such a pleasure to, um, especially in this day and age, sort of be invited back to share and and talk and hopefully learn from others. Um, I'm, you know, it's mixed feelings. I'm heartbroken at not being able to be there in person. Um, and it's, I have to say, very strange having this talk when I can't sort of make eye contact and, and field questions and comments in the course of this talk. So I, I just wanted to name that. Um, it, that is obviously um, far from the worst tragedy that uh, any of us are facing in the face of this pandemic, but um, it's a, a challenge nonetheless. And uh, I'm grateful to still be able to connect in some sort of way. Um, my hope today, uh, and I'm happy to, to uh, depart from this hope uh, in, in good keeping with palliative care professionals who need to roll with the punches. Uh, my hope is to uh, talk a bit, uh, and someone else is gonna click through the slides for me, I think, but uh, my hope is to talk about how I, uh, arrived myself at palliative care because it was in a, a very particular context in the world and a particular political and social situation. And um, I, I think and hope that something about that journey uh, will resonate uh, with you all. Um, and then I'd like to uh, briefly speak about where that work in palliative care has sort of taken me into some other areas uh, relevant to what's happening in the world today, um, and, and also to talk about how it's relevant to, uh, even without a pandemic, uh, what we're experiencing in America as a society. Um, so that's a lot, and I, I, I like hopefully all of that will roll into some stuff around spirituality. Um, that's a lot. I'm going to hope to get through that, and, and really, uh, I'm hoping for some give and take. I know it's technically challenging. Um, but there are a lot of things that we could talk about, um, and so I'm hoping that it, there will be enough remaining time for for some good uh, question answer back and forth that, that might direct where this will go. Um, so first slide. There you go. For, for the, those who are nervous about this, I, I assume people have seen the title before signing on to this. Uh, for those who have, are nervous, uh, I I think there's only one other slide with actual words on it, um, lest you worry that you're about to suffer an onslaught of an hour of uh, slides jammed with, with verbiage. Um, so uh, yeah, let's jump to the next slide. So as Paul noted, 
uh, I have no financial disclosures. I, I do feel that in, in giving this particular talk, and I, I imagine there's at least one or two people out of 146 listening right now uh, who saw the words Israel and Palestine and got a little bit nervous. Um, I, I feel like before I give this talk, I need to offer, I don't know if it's a disclaimer or a trigger warning, um, my intention is not to talk about politics. Uh, I, I guess the only politics I'm going to talk about is that we need to provide the best care possible for sick children and their families. And uh, it's hard for me to imagine anyone on this call is uh, going to have an issue with that. Uh, my goal is not to to really get into politics. And the, the reason why I mention it, you know, why bother at all? Why not just do it? is uh, there are, I believe, two maps that I'm gonna use in the course of this talk just to help uh, people understand where it is that some of the events in this talk took place. And uh, I don't know if anyone here has ever seen a map of the Middle East. Um, every map of the Middle East is by definition a political statement, right? Nobody agrees on all of the lines anywhere in the Middle East. Um, so I chose a couple of maps for the sake of clarity so that people who might not be familiar with the area I'm talking about could have some sense of, say, relative distances. Uh, but I want to be very clear at the outset that uh, I did not choose any map uh, as an endorsement of any line shown on those maps or uh, as a political position. It's uh, consider them um, cartoonish uh, images to show you guys uh, where we're talking about. So without further ado, next slide. So, oh, back one, back one. No, oh, you're flying ahead. Go back. There we go. Right after nothing to disclose. There we go. Sorry, thank you all for your patience with the uh, technical stuff as we learn how to do this together. Um, so a few words about my biography. Uh, Paul was very kind to offer some nice words. There are a few uh, highlights that I should mention to sort of bring you up to the point in time where this story begins. Um, I, I actually need to go all the way back to, well, childhood, actually. I'm a uh, rabbi's son. My dad's a conservative rabbi. And so uh, issues of spirituality, and uh, humanism were uh, always sort of part of the atmosphere of my home growing up. Uh, and in fact, uh, when I went to college, my, my first degree was in religious studies and theology. Uh, and my intention had been, in fact, not to become a physician, but rather to go to divinity school and become an academic uh, in theology or religious studies. Um, and I, I mention that because it's sort of speaks to where I am today. Um, and again, I'm going to sort of describe how my career unfolded. I think as things unfolded for me, anterior grade, as it were, uh, many of my decisions might not have made the most sense. Uh, and I certainly had a couple of mentors who I think pulled their hairs out over me. Um, but when I look back now, there is a very coherent arc uh, certainly from college and probably from childhood leading up to where I am today. And I, I suspect that the group I'm speaking with now will, will really get that. Um, after my, my undergraduate degree in theology, um, for a lot of complicated reasons, uh, I actually went to Israel and, and studied medicine there, intending to not go on to practice medicine but rather to uh, return to the States to go to divinity school. I had a very specific plan to go to Harvard Divinity School, don't ask, all sorts of weird details. Um, but by the end of medical school, weirdly, uh, perhaps not weirdly, found that I enjoyed it enough that I said, okay, I think I'm gonna give residency a try and, and, and see how this goes. And one thing led to another, and I found myself in short order trained in pediatrics, and then I went on to train in pediatric hematology oncology at Sloan Kettering. Um, and, and not long after that, uh, I returned to Israel to live in Tel Aviv and to work at Hadassah Medical Center in Ein Karim, Jerusalem, which is what's pictured here. Um, and I uh, took over the uh, care of children with pediatric sarcomas, that is solid tumors, primarily of 
muscle and bone, but also various soft tissues in children. Um, that's a long, weird journey from theology. Um, and I, I frankly always felt that there was a little piece missing. Uh, I was engaged as everyone is uh, in, in the course of their oncology fellowship in uh, research. I was a, a mouse researcher. I did a lot of bone marrow transplants on mice, which is I will certainly never be remembered for in future generations, uh, even though I had a successful project. But I really uh, I hate to say it, I didn't enjoy it. And I, I sort of always had a sense that there was a piece missing for me. And a, a big part of the story I'm about to share with you is how I found that piece uh, and how I, I put things together in a way that made more sense to me. Um, so this is Hadassah Medical Center. Uh, it is one of the uh, probably two major medical centers in the Jerusalem area. Hadassah actually has two campuses. This is, for those of you familiar with the area, the Ein Karim campus, uh, which is their main campus in the southwest of the city. It's in a very beautiful valley. Uh, you can sort of get a hint of that from this picture. It's where um, John the Baptist was born. There's a, a number of uh, historically important and also quite beautiful churches in the valley. Um, I, I sort of, I think I linger on that because there is something meaningful about the fact that it's a spiritually imbued uh, area that I, I went to work in, uh, really specifically that, that valley. Um, so next slide. We're sort of edging forward through the slides. Yes, yeah, so again, uh, attach no significance to any of these lines or labels, please. Uh, the purpose of this slide is to just give you a sense of where in the world I was working. So I was living in Tel Aviv. You can see on the west there, the Tel, Tel Aviv Jaffa. Um, sorry, I was living in Tel Aviv Jaffa. I was working in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is that that sort of almost looks like someone poked a finger into what here, this is an old map, uh, what's labeled as the West Bank. Uh, today, that would probably be more accurately labeled as the Palestinian Authority. Um, and Jerusalem is really right where you, you push the tip of your finger in there. The distance to give you a sense uh, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem with no traffic, which never happens, uh, but with, with no traffic, that's a 45 minute drive. Um, so things are pretty close. If you um, look from Tel Aviv up to where the Golan Heights is listed up there, that's about two hours. Uh, things are very, very much on top of each other there. And that's very relevant to, to this talk. Next slide. So what this is, uh, again, I'm not gonna go through what all these lines are because it's super confusing and that's exactly the point. This is if you zoomed in on where that fingertip poked into the West Bank or the Palestinian Authority. Um, and this zooms in on Jerusalem, greater Jerusalem. And what these lines represent are various municipal boundaries over the course of time since 1948. Um, and, and really, again, not to get lost in the details, I think the important message is um, that it is really complex and really confusing. And there's a lot of different um, ethnicities, national identities, political groups, religious groups, all sort of piled up on each other and you could literally have people living in the same neighborhood who might identify as one nationality versus a different nationality despite the fact that you're both living in the same neighborhood um, and and frankly that's part of what makes it um, an amazing exhilarating beautiful place to live um, and part of what makes it a maddening heartbreaking uh, and at times dangerous place to live uh, to give you a sense of where the uh, hospital is, God, I can't use a pointer on here. Um, if you look in the sort of the, um, towards the bottom left of this slide, uh, where the light blue line is, it says in Karam. Uh, that's the valley where that, where the main hospital is that I took a picture of. There's actually another uh, hospital campus off to the east, closer to one of those red lines, um, which is, is sort of, getting closer in towards territory uh, that is run by the Palestinian Authority. Um, so next slide. So 
So uh, this is a typical picture. For those of you who know Jerusalem, you might even be able to guess this is outside of the Jaffa Gate of the old city. Um, and, and this is uh, nobody who I know personally. This is sort of a representative picture of, of what Jerusalem is like. It's, it's amazing, as I mentioned. Um, and when I landed there uh, at Hadassah, I'd been to Israel many, many times. Half my life was really lived there, but I, I had never lived there as an adult and worked there. Um, part of what made working there so exciting and part of what catalyzed my transformation, which is what I'm working towards here, is the, the staff in the hospital, as well as the patient population, is made up of probably the most diverse group of people uh, I've ever experienced. And, and I have spent much of my medical training in New York City, which uh, one, one would probably have guessed that would be the, the most diverse place. Um, again, it's both the staff in the hospital and the patients are composed of um, Israeli Jews, Israeli Jews who were born in Israel, Jews who've immigrated from other places like myself, from uh, North America, from Europe, uh, from uh, Arab countries, significant number of Sephardic Jews, uh, Russian Jews. There are uh, Christians, Christians of various denominations. There's a, a big Armenian population. There's uh, a population of people from former Soviet states. There's Ethiopians. Uh, Ethiopians are actually, there's both a Jewish Ethiopian population and a, a, an Ethiopian Christian population. Uh, Arabs, including Israeli Arabs, including Palestinian Arabs. Uh, again, these are on both sides of the clinician-patient divide. Uh, and it, it was really such a spectacularly amazing place to work because you show up and um, I, this is going to sound um, a little kumbayash, and I'm happy to come back to this later uh, during the questions if people are interested. Uh, on, on the one hand, I think everybody in the hospital was certainly aware of who people were and what their ethnic backgrounds were and what countries they were from and what their political leanings might be. But the effort and the success really at creating a bubble within this hospital was something that um, I've just never experienced before. And it's something I've been thinking about a lot here in Chicago in the last six months as our own country undergoes a period of, of significant unrest. Um, I mean, I experienced two wars uh, working in that hospital. And uh, I can say without exaggeration, I mean, you had people who uh, on the outside of the hospital could have been uh, literally trying to kill each other uh, inside the hospital, uh, really coming together around the common goal of how do we support each other? How do we support families and children with serious illness? Um, I, I know it raises a lot of questions around uh, why the heck can't we transport some of that latter feeling to the uh, outside the bubble? And, and perhaps we can, that may be something we can talk about here. But I, you know, I really wanna paint this picture of um, this fascinating culturally diverse setup. And I, I emphasize it because it was really at Hadassah where I underwent my transformation from a pediatric oncologist to pediatric palliative care clinician. And uh, on the one hand, I do not believe that anyone has to leave the United States to become a, a terrific uh, pediatric palliative care or adult palliative care clinician. Uh, there are so many amazing clinicians uh, here in the States, many of whom have taught me. But I think for my own personal experience, uh, and I've thought about this a lot in the last five years, um, I, I don't think it's an accident that I had to be thrust into a different cultural milieu for me to undergo that transformation. There was something about the experience of, okay, now I'm caring for patients and working in a medical system, not on my terms. Uh, it's not that I can expect patients to behave in a way that I find culturally uh, appropriate or culturally in line with my norms. Uh, I suddenly have to meet them where they are, which I think we pay a lot of lip service to in general, but you know, this was the real thing. Um, 
you know, I could give you many examples, you know, ranging from simple things like patients barging on into my exam room when I'm with another patient, which used to make me bananas and which here in the States, I think would be largely unthinkable. And, and they're, you know, um, it's kind of how their lives and nobody meant ill by it and people would just sort of you know a nurse would hop in in the middle of an exam to grab the, the jar of q-tips or another patient would stick their head in to say don't forget my daughter's out here and i, I kind of had to learn how to roll with it um, and i don't know if those seem like um glib examples but it, it was a real it was really being thrust through the looking glass and this despite the fact that I had spent really half my life living over there, but but functioning as a clinician, having been trained as a clinician in a certain milieu, uh, and then jammed into that one was a real was a real eye opener for me. That uh, whose impact I think I'm still unpacking. Um, next next slide. So. I, I actually want to share one particular story with you all um, because uh, we all love stories, right? Stories are, are how we best uh, demonstrate these things. And, and because this story occurred to me at a time when I really was making my pivotal shift towards becoming a palliative care clinician, um, I'm not sure it was clear from, from Paul's introduction, I no longer practice primary oncology, although it's still a big part of my DNA. I, I now just practice uh, pediatric palliative care for, for a lot of reasons. Um, but the shift really occurred, uh, you know, the old mind gradually and then all at once. Uh, and, and this particular story occurred right around sort of a breakthrough moment. So um, this is this is not my patient's uh, specific scan. Uh, this is a scan of a typical scan, representative scan of a child with stage four high risk neuroblastoma. Um, and uh, as you might from the sound of the the disease, uh, it's a terrible, terrible disease um, with very poor prognosis. Um, this is a child who has. Um, I don't think we have to get too deep into it, but this kid has multiple metastases all over the body and in the bone marrow, uh, which is pretty typical of kids showing up with widespread metastatic high-risk neuroblastoma. Um, I was in charge of the care of children with neuroblastoma at Hadassah uh, in Karam during the time I was there. And um, partway through my tenure there, I met this little girl uh, who, when we started, was a two-year-old. Uh, a Palestinian child uh, who showed up very sick one day with a, a large abdominal mass and tumors all over the place, just like in this picture. Uh, wonderful, wonderful parents, um, which I think played into it. Not that we should care for anyone differently, but her parents actually spoke really good English. And my my Arabic, uh, which I've worked on, is is fairly rudimentary still. And I, I do think the fact that they spoke English, so we were able to speak without an interpreter most of the time, uh, played a role in in the relationship we developed and the impact that this child and family had on me. Um, wonderful kid, actually. Mom uh, was a cancer survivor herself, and and so sort of came to the table with uh, a lot of both insights, but also a lot of. Uh, baggage in terms of fears, uh, although she herself was and remains a survivor. Uh, I'm still in touch with them. Years later, I'm in touch with them. Um, so this was a little girl who came in with uh, metastatic disease, and I began treatment uh, at Hadassah in Jerusalem, as, as with all the hospitals in Israel. We have state-of-the-art treatment. We were a part of the uh, cutting-edge European trials in neuroblastoma. There was no drug, no treatment that this child could not get access to. Um, in, despite the fact that she was a Palestinian who had come to us, we we care for a lot of kids from the Palestinian Authority. Again, I can loop back and get into that later if people are curious about the um, intricacies intricacies of how that works. Um, so we gave her cutting edge, world class upfront therapy, and she uh, responded well. Um, and then just before the end of the upfront therapy. Um, Unfortunately, she uh, experienced a relapse of her disease, which uh, again, as you might imagine, 
uh, experiencing a, a relapse of disease while still on upfront therapy is uh, a terribly grim prognostic sign on top of what was already uh, a disease with a terribly grim prognosis. Um, and so, you know, we, I think I would like to believe we started having conversations about this is going to be harder, but um, as oncologists um, are wont to do, and I, I say this without judgment, because um, I think that it's, it, it comes with the job, um, I came up with uh, a second line therapy, chemotherapy, and began treatment, and she responded well and, and, and felt good. And that lasted for a couple of months and uh, until something started to grow again. And then I started second line therapy and third line and pretty sure I made it through four lines of chemotherapy, if not five. Uh, you know, we're very good at coming up with more things that might help. Um, but sure enough, the day came when um, I'd been through a number of lines of chemotherapy with this family and this child. And the day came when uh, she experienced another relapse uh, and we sent off scans and the scans came back and they were probably irrelevant because the parents knew just from looking at her um, where I had to sit down with them and say, um, you know, there's no other therapy that I know of in the world that can offer any sort of realistic chance of, of having an impact here. Um, and, and I think anything that I, came up with here would have a, a greater chance of hurting her rather than helping her. Um, and her mother, who, as I mentioned, uh, had been through some therapy herself, chemotherapy, and, and was a very sharp woman, looked at me and said, okay, well, it's it's been over a year now. It was actually, I think, about a year and a half into this. And she said, go back to the first chemotherapy. Go give her the stuff that she got at the very beginning that was really strong, because the tumor hasn't seen that in a long time. And it was an interesting moment. Um, it's hard for me to not know among the listeners here, you know, sort of who's got what background. Uh, oncologists will certainly relate to this. Um, that's not typically something that we do, although there is a weird logic in it. Um, but typically the teaching in oncology is, you know, the cancer that has grown through a therapy at whatever time point um, is probably resistant to that therapy. And, you know, this wasn't the first time I had been faced with this sort of question, um, but for some reason, and I really don't know the reason why, there was something about this family, this child, this point in time in my life and my own career, where that question um, just broke me, just broke me. Um, and I think I had already been sort of getting interested in palliative care and waking up to the fact that there was this field and maybe that was a sign that I was being primed for this, but I just broke. And I, I couldn't get my head around the fundamental question, which we all face caring for really sick kids at some point, um, which is the who is my patient question. You know, is my patient here, this little girl, which is, as a pediatrician, I was trained to Think of myself as an advocate for the child. Um, so is she my patient and is my job to protect her from chemotherapy that might cause more harm than good? Or are my patients these parents? Because this kid is gonna die. I mean, at that point, it, it was clear that she had no real prognosis and um, are my patients the parents? Is it my job to allow them to feel that they had done everything, whatever everything is? I, 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 you know, I'm not comfortable with that term. Um, but to uh, help them to go on and rebuild their life in whatever way it is that parents try to rebuild after losing a child. Um, and and I struggled. I struggled. Um, and we didn't have a lot of time for a struggle because uh, decisions had to be made. And I um, talked to some of my colleagues in the States. As I said, I was just getting interested in palliative care. And so fortunately, was lucky enough to have some, some connections here and some colleagues in palliative care who I could 
sort of talk to as a sounding board. Um, and I realized that in all the time that I've been caring for this child, and I, I hope that I was a good physician. I'd like to think I was a good physician. I, I certainly cared. Um, but I realized that in all my time, I had really failed to ask an important question. And this was really, again, like over a year and a half, which is, is hard for me to get my head around now. You know, I was so caught up on this question of who is my patient, you know, parents or child. And I don't think I had ever engaged in the question of who is my patient? Who are these people? Who is this child? You know, who are they as people? What, what makes them tick? What are they hoping for? What are they afraid of? Um, what are their values? What are their fears? I mean, really, um, all the stuff that, that you know, we should be thinking about when we think about whole person care, uh, right? Which is what I think many of us on this call probably dedicate ourselves to now. Um, but for me, that was a real moment, uh, and not, not necessarily a proud moment. And as I said, I didn't have a lot of time. And the, sort of the next day after I had that moment, I, I sort of began a series of intensive conversations with the parents with some, some quick skills I had learned from my colleagues in the States, um, in which I subsequently went on to, I, I did a palliative care fellowship after this story, um, which is really, that fellowship is really focused on how do you do this stuff? Well, um, you know, I had to do the quick job of it. And we started talking about, you know, what's important to you guys? And, um, you know, it's these moments that you never forget, right? After several hours spread out over two days, uh, was sitting close to the parents, no table in between us, uh, just chatting with them. And the mother cut me off and she said, Dr. Alicia, enough. We know that you love our daughter, which still, this was years ago, it chokes me up still. I mean, you know, what, what higher praise could a clinician ever hope for than to have a parent of a child who you've, in some respects, failed? I mean, their, their kid's gonna die under my care and the parents are willing to say, we know you love our daughter, which is true. Um, we know you love her. Tell us what to do. And because of those conversations that I had had over the two days, which I probably should have been having over a much longer period of time, I was able to say to them, to reflect back with them and say, listening to you, it sounds like the things that are important are to have her not be in the hospital for as much as possible and to feel as good as possible for as long as possible. And I'm really worried that you know, the heavy stuff that you're asking about doesn't line up with that. You know, how does that sound? And they looked at me, um, again, moments you never forget, the mother looked at me and said, yeah, you're right, you're right. And, you know, really put another way, and I, I, I wanna be careful what I'm about to say, because um, I am still an oncologist, as I said, in my DNA. Um, so I want to say this respectfully about oncologists. This is a reflection of my own experience in training. I think a lot of my training as an oncologist was to see this image when I look at my patients, to see scans and biopsies and staging and protocols. And next slide, please. I, I think uh, as you flip to the next slide, I think a lot of what I experienced as this transformation was, you know, learning how instead of seeing this image, um, was really learning how to see, uh, I hope the next slide, nope, nope, I think we're in the wrong direction. Next slide. Yes. Um, was learning how to see this. Sorry, we're flipping all over. Back to, back to the Picasso blue period. Back one. 
There you go. Blue period first, then Guernica. Um, everybody knows my art history lessons now. I think seeing the mother and child as a mother and child. I mean, I, I make these references a lot. I, I actually almost majored in art history. It was interesting thinking about the origins I came from. You know, I don't think we're trained to see this. I think chaplains maybe, and I think it's, uh, I'll be curious to hear people's reflections after this talk, but I, I think this is not something that physicians are, at least when I was being trained and where I was being trained, this wasn't how I was taught to see my patients. And I, I think that's unfortunate. And a lot of this pivotal moment with this family was, was switching to this, to, to seeing the people and the relationships, um, the ineffable. I just spent a lot of the morning today writing about the ineffable, seeing, seeing this relationship, which can't be put into words and understanding in your gut, the impact and the meaning of it. And, and then to go deeper into the next slide, um, it was already given away. The next slide is a, a study from Picasso's Guernica. You know, I mean, I, this is one of the sort of the fragments of Guernica that I find to be most traumatic. Um, you know, for those, many of you are probably familiar with the, the painting of after the bombing of uh, the marketplace in Guernica during the Spanish Civil War, you know, to be able to see the anguish of, of a mother whose child is being ripped from her. Um, is a skill and it's something that I think we have to train our trainees, whether it's in chaplaincy or medicine or, or really anything where we're caring for sick people. Um, we have to be trained to see this. We have to be trained to understand that this is not just okay, that this is necessary to be able to see this. Um, it's fascinating to me, just reflecting on the previous painting and this painting, but remain on this slide, that you know, it's the less realistic and less figurative painting that most deeply elicits the emotion. I mean, and there's something to that, to opening yourself to, to sort of be less figurative in, in what we're experiencing day to day in the hospital and not just taking things at, at its surface value. Um, so having gone through this this transformation, I and I, I apologize for lingering on this story for a while, but I think it's really central to to what I'm trying to get at here. Um, I came up with a plan with the family for some mild chemotherapy that was going to hopefully slow the disease and but not cause any ill effects and keep her out of the hospital. And indeed, that's what we succeeded in doing for for I think it was about three four weeks. Um, and then after uh, three weeks or so, she showed up in the hospital um, with clearly just advanced disease, in great deal of pain, and, and clearly looking at uh, end of life within the next few days. Um, you're really far gone. It's quite painful. And for those of you who I don't I don't know, it's another uh, sort of element of doing these talks over video. I can't read the emotional impact of the story I just told. Um, I hope most of you got the emotional impact. For those of you who um, think that was a terrible story, uh, so the next part gets worse. Um, let's go to the next slide. So many of you, I'm sure, are involved in. Uh, end of life care, including end of life care of uh, children with serious diseases. Um, my my end of life care of this family um, was complicated by the fact that um, this was right outside the hospital. Um, and again, I'm I'm going to be careful not to get into politics beyond the impact of of how that feels for the patient's experience. Um, this is looking from my hospital parking lot. For those of you who know Hadassah, this is actually the, uh, the Mount Scopus campus. Um, the uh, wall that you can see in the middle there uh, with the tall buildings behind it, that's the separation barrier between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. 
Um, the uh, buildings behind it are actually a refugee camp. Uh, it's probably not the image of a refugee camp that many of you are, are used to. Um, so this family lived on the other side of a separation barrier, which obviously did not mean they could not get to the hospital because clearly fact is I was caring for them. But what it meant was, as we talked about end of life care, excuse me, as we talked about end of life care, I had to ask the parents the following question, which really no one should ever have to ask a parent, which was, where does it make the most sense for your child to die? Which, stay with me because we ask families that all the time. But here the question is, does it make more sense for your child to die? And just think about the absurdity of, does anything make sense about a child dying? Does it make more sense for your child to die at home, in the comfort of her bed, in her own cultural milieu, surrounded by her family and friends and spiritual leaders, um, but without the medical care of our team, because I and my team and our community-based hospice, which is rudimentary, so mostly community-based hospice meant us, um, we can't go to your home because of where it's located. It's not safe for us. It's actually not legal. Um, or does it make more sense for your child to die in our hospital where I can promise you we will be here 24 seven, we will attend to all of her needs, we will not let her suffer, we'll give her exquisite symptom management, you can both be at her bedside all the time, but we probably can't get extended family permission to come in, it's very politically sticky, um, I can't promise who's gonna be here, um, and you're gonna be away from your, your home. That is a terrible, terrible decision for parents to have to make. Um, you know, the decision about home or hospital, which we do discuss here all the time, should be in the context of, hey, we can provide great medical care in either place. Which one feels the most comfortable to you? Um, and the way this was framed was awful. You know, and again, I'm not gonna get into the politics beyond to say, because this is relevant to the rest of my talk, if there is one thing that you would think could transcend politics, I'm not gonna get into who's right or wrong because I actually, everybody's wrong when it comes to this particular instance. Um, if there's one thing you would think could transcend, it would be the death of a child. But we could all come together and figure out how to make that happen in a way that provides the most meaning for parent and child. And um, I've been scarred by this case and others uh, where parents were forced to make that decision. And in a moment, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, where that has led me in my career and why I think that's relevant to us today, um, elsewhere in the world. Um, in this particular instance, uh, the family uh, chose to stay with us in the hospital and um, she, she passed away. It was one of those weird cases where uh, she literally died in my hands, which you know people say in the movies, but it never happens. But here it happened, and um, uh, yeah, and the family's actually gone on to have another child who's healthy, just as a, a postscript uh, to end that story with one positive note. Um, so. You know, I, I offer this story in the context of my own transformation to palliative care clinician because I think that there's a lot to be said for um, what palliative care teaches us, and, and frankly, chaplaincy, because I've spent an awful lot of my time with chaplains since becoming a palliative care clinician. Again, speaking back to my own roots in theology, um, and I, I think we're interested in similar things. Um, there's a lot to be said for the power of seeing our patients for who they are, for who they really are. Um, and, and, you know, that was certainly a powerful lesson for me in the Middle East. And I, um, going on from this particular work, I continued beyond this story to work for a couple of years in Jerusalem, several years actually. And um, I also worked with um, 
Syrian refugees, refugees from the Syrian uh, civil war during that time, uh, which, uh, you know, as everybody knows, Syria is technically at war with Israel. So caring for uh, wounded Syrians was a particularly powerful moment of seeing the other and relating to the other and tending to the other in a way that transcends uh, superficial boundaries. Um, next slide. Uh, this is just we can go past this. This is just a reminder of how messy <laughs> messy that whole situation is. Next slide. And oh, back one. Sorry, I apologize to whoever's doing the clicking. This this is the states. Um, I, you know, I want to make the point that you've all probably seen coming now for several minutes, which is. Um, I work in Chicago now. Uh, I've been here for three years. Um, you know, it's interesting. I had never really been to Chicago before, and I've learned a lot in the last three years, and I've learned even in the last six months. Uh, Chicago is no less divided than Jerusalem. Uh, unfortunately, I think after the last couple of years, I, I would probably also make the statement that this country as a whole is no less divided than Jerusalem. Um, but Chicago is no less divided. We just don't have a wall. We don't have an actual physical wall. But there is half of a city here that is afraid to come to our hospital for care, that feels disenfranchised, that feels judged, that feels if they come to us, they may get lesser care, they may be lied to, they may be experimented on. Um, by the way, they may not, they may not, they're not wrong about a lot of that, unfortunately. You know, this has become all the more acute in the last six months. And I think that palliative care and chaplaincy, frankly, because I, again, I, I feel that the two are deeply intertwined and maybe one of the things we can talk about is, is the nature of that intertwining. Um, I feel that the lessons that we have to bring to the bedside about seeing patients for who they really are um, have so much to bring to the conflict that we are experiencing in this country right now. Forget about the pandemic, just with, with the racial divides and the systemic bias, which are all so real and so harmful. You know, and there's so much that we as palliative care providers and spiritual caretakers can bring to our colleagues in teaching how to be present at the bedside, how to not make assumptions based on someone's appearance or language, um, how to actually listen and how to get to, you know, who is this person? What are they really hoping for here? And what are they really afraid of here? And how do I help them navigate the system to provide care that's meaningful? Um, and, and I, I think that's, that's the message for palliative care for all of America today. Um, if only we could bottle it and give everyone a little dose. Um, next slide. I'm going to move sort of quickly because I want to laugh for this is on, on the left is, is actually a picture out of one of my patients, uh, homes. Uh, in the Palestinian Authority, it's, it's actually fascinating. It's, uh, as you can see, there's not even glass in there. Although the room that this was taken out of, the parents put all of their attention and energies and, and finances into making his room, I was caring for him at home at end of life, um, is actually not technically in the Palestinian Authority. It was sort of living in the, um, there's a zone in between Israel and the Palestinian Authority without getting too into the politics, but where we were able to go. Um, and this is a two minute drive away from uh, a fairly posh neighborhood in, in Jerusalem, West Jerusalem. Um, and the point of this picture is, you know, the same, the same lessons exist, whether you're in the Palestinian Authority or Jerusalem, or whether you're in Chicago, that's our hospital. And, and honestly, um, half a block off from this picture uh, has been the site of um, recurrent rioting. And I, I use that term intentionally because uh, I don't believe demonstrations are riots. 
Um, but half a block away from this picture, we've had you know massive looting um, and breaking of storefronts uh, over the last six months repeatedly. Um, and so, it, you know, you're talking about two different settings, very different settings in the context of conflict, where I think the same principles apply. Um, next slide. I, I just want to share with you all, and then I'm going to open this up, and we'll figure out if technology truly allows for a discussion. Next slide beyond this. I, I want to just share with you all, perfect, sort of one more place that, that this work took me, um, place in a larger sense. So uh, my work with Palestinians and, and then my work, uh, as I mentioned, with Syrian refugees, uh, Syrian wounded, uh, really got me thinking uh, about two, three years ago about you know, how do we provide this kind of care in the context of um, not just social strife, but actual conflict? Like what happens when the bombs are falling? And that's that's what I experienced working with Syrians. I mean, I, I cared for Syrians while there was there were Russian bombs falling uh, closer than a kilometer away. I mean, it's really a sort of experience that you sort of feel like you're making it up when you repeat it because it feels so surreal now. Um, and and I uh, had this amazing experience as I started to get interested in this idea of, of discovering this community starting to flourish in the palliative care world uh, around the world. There's a big group of us here in the States through the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine, but there's a lot of people around the globe who over the last few years have started to think about what does it mean to introduce palliative care into humanitarian crises? Right? How do we both provide the best medical care possible, but also how do we apply these principles of palliative care, seeing the other? Are, are there roles in, in the face of humanitarian crises, especially those driven by conflict? Are there places where palliative care uh, integration could really be helpful? And that is um, the subject of a whole different long talk, but I wanted to mention it here. This is a picture of um, the Rohingya camps in Bangladesh, you know, think about what it means to provide any medical care, uh, let alone good palliative care, uh, in this setting where, you know, talking to my colleagues there, uh, I'm supposed to go there myself right around when this picture was taken and my second child was born and uh, my wife, God bless her, told me to go, but I'm, I'm a, hopefully a better person than that. So I've unfortunately not been here myself. My colleagues uh, who work there, say, you know, even just describing for other clinicians which hut or home you're supposed to go to. I mean, there's there's no streets, there's no labels. Uh, it gets worse when the monsoon hits. Uh, next slide. The, the rapidity with which these crises can occur. So here you're talking about, uh, about a four month change in 2017, as the crisis was unfolding, you can see this satellite image. Um, this is uh, where the camps are in Bangladesh. This is about a million people um, in four months. You know, think about, first of all, think about looking at this pre-COVID pandemic, because this was mind boggling back then. Unfortunately, uh, in the last seven months, I think we've all gained a different understanding of, of sort of what this means. So this, this work led me into um, some work with a group of people around the world. And last January, uh, I'm proud to report and just want to share, we, we published with Oxford University Press the first ever field manual of palliative care in humanitarian crises, which we envisioned as a fairly niche product uh, and we were sort of busy and we had just started marketing it with uh, Doctors Without Borders and a couple of other aid groups and had just started talking about how to integrate some of this with the handbook into their training. Um, and then of course the pandemic hit and uh, suddenly this handbook became not a niche product but became um, some unfortunately and weirdly very necessary document that's been used uh, Oxford University Press uh, graciously actually put the whole book online for free as the pandemic was unfolding because they they realized that the information was going to be too important and they couldn't really 
charge countries around the world for it uh, at this time. So um, next slide. So I'm really zipping through the next couple. You know, this is just, um, you know, just a nod. I won't linger on this too long. Just, you know, the humanitarian crises come in all sorts of different forms and shapes, uh, some some violent, some infectious, like we're experiencing, some unfortunately combinations of all of the above. Uh, next slide. And we're, we're doing a lot of work, a lot of people are doing a lot of work on how do we integrate palliative care into these humanitarian crises. And I, I, I left this in, and this is really the end of, of this portion of the talk, because I do want to open it up now. I, I, I debated including the humanitarian crisis stuff here, but I wanted to share it, you know, not as the most important brunt of the talk, but because I think and hope what I've tried to convey is you know, my own journey to understanding the importance of seeing the other um, and, and tapping into the other in the context of conflict, especially in the context of conflict. I mean, God, it's important even without conflict. Um, and I think in light of the events of the last seven months, I, I wanted to uh, give you all sort of a brief insight into where things are in terms of humanitarian crises, because I think these lessons uh, in our current political climate and medical climate are things that we all need to be thinking about and, and sort of constantly promoting. Um, there's a lot of dust in the air right now, so to speak, and who knows when the dust settles, uh, how this is all going to translate out. And I think you know, these lessons are important things we have to be thinking about as, as hopefully, God willing, uh, some dust settles uh, coming into 2021. God, dust had better settle. Um, so uh, I want to close with that. I want to, I was going to joke, I want to thank you all for your silence. Um, I, I'm actually saddened by the silence. I wish I had been interrupted uh, 15 times for questions and thoughts. And uh, I want to pass this back over to Paul is moderator. I don't know if questions have popped up, but I, I really uh, would be happy to answer questions, talk about any of this stuff, um, or, or hear thoughts, because uh, nary a talk goes by without my learning something from people, and I want to put the pressure on. It's especially true when I talk to my chaplaincy colleagues, so thank you. Well, I think you're on mute. Thank you. Yeah, I've got a two-step mute process. Thanks, Elisha. So I can't speak for everybody, but uh, much acclaim and much applause for the um, for the talk and being privileged to spend some time with you. That went by really fast for me. So, and I uh, a lot of it was uh, new, of course, especially around the humanitarian pieces. And I have, in full disclosure, downloaded the book, but have not read it. So I appreciate that. I also know um, I had read uh, another one of your books that you had um, published, this one called This Narrow Space. I know that's the title of the talk that we had here. A question for me is I was drawn uh, especially, well, to many of the stories, but at the end, the uh, story you tell about approaching, is it echoing? You can't hear me. I can hear you. You can, okay. Can you hear me, Elisha? Can... Well, I think you're on mute now. No, he's fine. Oh, yes, okay. Elisha, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay. You can't, but you can hear me, Andy. Yeah. Okay. Oh, is it, is it? Is it? You're, uh, you're breaking in and out. Okay, I'll try to get it out then. I was wondering if you could say a little more about the story that you tell at the end of your book, uh, uh, this narrow space, when you talk about the gentleman that you met, um, who was there kind of day and night, who's praying the Psalms. Uh, just that whole aspect of uh, people understanding palliative care, and um, that how he, I think he he misunderstood you to be somebody else. Uh, 
I'm wondering if you could say just a little bit more about that story because I know you didn't tell it. Can you hear me when I asked that question, Elisha? Uh, it's breaking up. Okay. Uh, tell you what. You're breaking it out. You you want me to say more about some story? I'm not sure which one. Um, I tell you what, uh, Elisha, if you want to, it looks like there's a question in the chat. Should I take these out? Is it me? Uh, it might be. It could be me. Um, yeah. Hey, that question was for me. This oh, is Brad Benson again. Oh, good. Thanks, Brad. Hey, so I just, you know, as I listen to you, and uh, thank you, first off, I mean, this is a, a, a amazing uh, uh, talk that that had a bunch of peaks and valleys emotionally, and, and uh, you know, I, it resonates with me. I do a clinic for uh, adult survivors of childhood cancer, and a lot of these stories uh, really connected. What I kept thinking about was this concept of co-production. I had the joy of listening to Paul Batalden speak, and he's one of the founders of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. And, you know, he happens to live in St. Paul down the road and, you know, in his, I think, 60 hour a week retirement, you know, he's really focused on this concept of co-production. And his argument is that we have it wrong, that, you know, healthcare is a service. And that, you know, a service in every way requires two people to come together and, and you know, collaborate deeply to co-create the desired outcome. And instead, what we offer is this product. Uh, and I'm just, you know, that. so when I, in the introduction, was talking about the individuals sometimes known as patients, you know, it, that was completely stolen from Paul's view uh, of, you know, that deep lived experience of, you know, these individuals sometimes known as patients has to inform our care delivery. And I'm just curious if you've, if you've uh, come across that concept of, or could think about it through that lens and I'll uh, go mute here. Alessia, did you hear that question? Hmm. I, 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 I heard you say that just now. I got like snatches of it. Well, actually, I apologize. I think things are just coming in and out. Did you see uh, Dr. Benson's question was in the chat uh, or a version of it? Um, he put a lot of nice flesh on it when he- Although I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna get on my phone. So can you hear me? Now I can hear you. All right. Well, I said nice things about you and thanked you for a stellar presentation. <laughs> no, I'll my, cut to the I, I I hope that it came through. I deeply apologize. So that's okay. The question relates to this lens of uh, health care service you know as so essentially healthcare is a service uh requiring deep collaboration between you know the individuals sometimes known as patients who bring you know all of their lived experience their own value compass what their desired outcomes are uh and us and you know that the only way we'll create that desired outcome is through true collaboration and co-production. And what, so, you know, Paul Batalden would argue that we have currently produced healthcare as a product rather than a service. And we say, you know, this is what we're offering. 
You know, we're real proud of it. Uh, we hope it fits your needs. And when you were talking, it so it spoke to me around that missing piece was that with which is that deep understanding uh, of what our individual sometimes known as patients want and need. Yeah, I, I could, first of all, I love hearing you loud and clear. This is so, so nice. Um, I apologize. I didn't flip to the phone earlier. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think the, the commodification of, of medicine, I mean, it, it, I think it's even worse than you described. Like it's, it's us saying, here's the product, we hope you like it. But that's also what leads to patients and families coming in and, you know, because they sort of then buy into that presentation of it. And they show up and they say, well, I don't like this product. Give me, give me that product, right? I mean, like the fact that, that our healthcare system is, we've drifted from a co-production and turned it into like this tug of war over which products you can and can't have. And I think that's a real problem. So, uh, Elisha, can you hear me? Yeah, you hear me? Yeah, yeah, this is good. Um, I think there was a question in here, and I'm trying to get to it through my Q&A function. While I'm trying to do that, the question I was trying to ask you earlier was, I so appreciated the story you told at the end of your book in this narrow space, uh, kind of throwing that uh, uh, time where you're talking about your namesake, and it was that yeah. uh, young father uh, who was there praying uh, the Psalms and uh, you approached him and he didn't know that you, you were a, a palliative care doc and I don't know I just love the story and that whole experience of kind of um, palliative care who are you I, I don't know I don't I don't know if you could say more about whether Chicago or you know New Haven Connecticut or uh, you know New York City that whole experience of, uh, of interpreting and translating what it means to be a palliative care doc yeah, it's, look, we, it's really hard, right? I mean, I say all the time when I give talks, like, uh, we're the only clinicians in the hospital who have to start a talk by explaining what the hell it is that we do. Like, you know, there's no cardiologist has to open a talk with, and I take care of the heart. Um, you know, I mean, I, I'm exaggerating. I'm sure people, you know, you can get into intricacies, but um it's challenging for that reason. It's challenging because I think societally there are a lot of misperceptions that um, persist around what palliative care is. I think a lot of our medical colleagues have misperceptions around what we do. I mean, some of my colleagues here in Chicago think I'm the end of life team, which couldn't be further from the truth. Um, and I, you know, frankly, I mean, I, I'm very involved sort of with the national uh, organization. We've come so far in the last two decades, but there's we're still engaged in some debate among ourselves around, you know, how we should be marketing ourselves, how we should be defining ourselves. Like these are not sort of pat questions, which is part of what makes it maddening and part of what makes it awesome to be a part of it. Right. Because it keeps it interesting, but um, it's certainly a dynamic, interesting field. Okay. All right. So here, I do have a question here for you that uh, somebody, they, again, a, a generous sense of thank you and um, a claim for who you are, what you do. Uh, they write, I'd love to hear any thoughts you might have as a physician writer about the role and space for narrative and writing in spirituality and palliative care. Yeah. Um, good question. I mean, I, I uh, there's, Sort of different ways one can interpret that question. That's why I'm sort of sorry. We're also sorry we're not in the same room. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of work that's been done and being done looking at the role of narrative medicine, meaning, you know, writing and, and discussing writing in terms of patient care, meaning a patient actually writes about the experience they're having and, and that that becomes both in itself a therapeutic exercise and becomes the vehicle for communication with the, the clinical team. 
Um, I have a, a really close friend, Chris Adrian, uh, who some of you may know. Chris is um, uh, a highly acclaimed novelist, uh, but he also happens to be a pediatric palliative care physician uh, at LA Children's, and he he does a lot of projects with with this, with narrative medicine, sort of you know giving prompts and having patients write, and then you know again both capitalizing on the therapeutic benefits of the writing itself, but then also using that product as a vehicle. Uh, you know another way, and I'm not sure which way this question was intended. I, I another facet to the question could be, you know, what's the role in terms of our national conversation? Um, I mean, I I get into this debate a lot with some of my mentors in palliative care, sort of the relative value that some might place on, um, say, a article in a leading medical journal versus a piece in the New York Times or, you know, a TED Talk. Um, I think that, you know, traditionally in medicine, the popular facing stuff has not been um, applauded in the same way or valued in the same way, uh, you know, with the exception of like, you know, the huge heavy hitters like Atul Gawanda, who clearly changed the national conversation around palliative care. Um, I, I happen to believe very strongly that um, having our voices faced publicly, and by our, I mean, uh, with a nod to the, the previous question about co-production, I think our patient voices and our clinician voices um, should be, to some extent, aimed out at the public. Um, that, that there's a lot we can do in terms of influencing public opinion around healthcare policy um, and awareness and philanthropy, which, you know, dollars count when you're trying to, you know, improve things. Um, and and people who write their stories to put them out there, I think, um, are doing an important service. It may also be therapeutic on a personal level, but but I think that's another important venue. So it's a long answer to a question that, uh, you know, big thumbs up on on writing. And, and especially, you know, the other parts of that question was about spirituality. You know, it, it's fascinating when it comes to the, the ineffable, as I mentioned. You know, how do you write about spirituality, which many have done successfully, but it, it amazes me that anyone pulls it off. It's like writing art or music criticism. You know, how do you write about an experience in a way that conveys it in a, in a meaningful way? And I think that that's, that's important. It's really important for people who can pull that off. Thank you, Elisha. Uh, so this question comes from uh, somebody who identifies as a uh, licensed professional, I think certified counselor, forgive me if I'm getting that wrong, here in Minnesota, uh, that they are specifically a play and equine assisted therapist. Um, can you please speak to the intersections of palliative care and mental health? Uh, can you share any info on the emerging field of palliative care centered mental health care with child patients? Yeah, I mean, that's such an important question and, and concepts. Look, we're uh, and I'm an eternal optimist, despite everything I've mentioned in this talk. Um, you know, it says something when you can live in the Middle East, take care of dying children, and, and emerge an optimist. Um, I, I think I'm a true believer in interdisciplinary palliative care, right? We're talking about whole person care. And in its, in its greatest form, that means creating the, the, the greatest holistic network one possibly can around patients and families, you know, and that certainly includes mental health professionals. Um, I, I think we're at an important, I'm going to guess, decade. I mean, who knows? Who can guess anything at this point? I can't guess what's going to happen next month. But I, I, I'm thinking that we're in an important decade in the development of palliative care. You know, when palliative care started off, especially pediatric palliative care, most centers, you know, were, were basically just throwing it a bone to, to check a box. And it was mostly, you know, it, uh, I mean, look at where I'm working now. I, I'm a division head of a fairly, one of the most robust palliative care programs in North America. 
and, and I'm only here because there were two to three people whose shoulders I'm standing on who 15 years ago said, well, the hospital is not really supporting this, but we're going to do this in our spare time and, you know, fight tooth and claw. And, and, and they did it, you know, until the hospital recognized the value. And then the hospital said, okay, we'll pay you guys, you know, the physicians to do this. And then the hospital had a moment where they said, oh, hmm, well, now we'll pay for some nurse practitioners. And, you know, things build over time. And I think we're at a point now where there's still a lot of especially smaller healthcare systems that are fighting just for one to two clinicians. But I think it's more accepted that standard of care is at least, uh, you know, physician, nursing staff, and uh, some sort of psychosocial professional. Usually it's statistically, it tends to be a social worker, but it certainly doesn't have to be. That's whole other debate. Um, and, and I think and hope we're entering a phase now where, you know, having established this is a real thing, as a must-have, as, as my department chair would say, um, I, I hope that the trend is going to be towards, great, like now you've got four physicians and five nurse practitioners and one social worker as, as your team. Like, you know, where's the where's the psychologist? Where's the child life therapist? Where's the chaplain? I mean, and there are there are places. I mean, CHOP, for example, CHOP's palliative care group has uh, child life and chaplaincy on their payroll as as a formal part of their Peds palliative care team. And and I think, um, I mean, it's not a big reveal to anyone at my center. That's certainly on my agenda. It, it ain't going to happen tomorrow, but. Um, you know, if you ask my dream agenda, um, you know, all of the above and, and, you know, mental health and spiritual health are both, that's what we're talking about, right? I mean, if, if, if we don't have those components, um, then I'm just a pediatrician guessing at the mental health stuff. I mean, I'm probably underselling myself there, but you know, we, we have to have the appropriate experts. So, um, you know, that's my aspirational response to that question, but I, I hope we're entering a different phase. I think, uh, again, not to get too American political, I think uh, what happens with healthcare reform uh, in the coming months and year or two are going to have an important impact because, you know, we do have to figure out how we're going to pay for these things. Alexa, <laughs> some other questions came in and they're really good. But I'm aware that we have to say farewell to you and your pink flamingo. Um, so uh, that, that's my wife. I, I give my wife credit for everyone here. Yeah. <laughs> but friends, thanks for joining us. For those who are still on, uh, I, you will be receiving a link um, about the recording, and for about a month, we'll leave open the opportunity for you to complete the survey and receive your certificate for the hours. Again, Dr. Walden, thank you so much for your time, the generosity, who you are, and what you do for the patients, families, and staff that you work with in your setting as well as a larger um, group of us who get to know and study your work. Yeah, thank you. Thank you guys all. Thank everyone who I can't see for your patience and for listening. And, and thanks Paul and staff for, for having me. I really appreciate it. It's been, I love this stuff. All right, thanks so much, Elijah. Appreciate it. Be well.